And thanks so much, Marina. It's good to be back. I really enjoy teaching this class. And um, uh, I really, I will um, take, uh, after we go through a couple sections, I'll pause and ask if there's any questions. Um, and so certainly if you think of anything as I'm going through this, um, please don't be shy about asking a question. So it's really four parts that we'll go over today. Um, the first part, I'm just going to go through different variables associated with El Nino and La Nina. In section two, we'll be talking about how all those variables uh, are linked together. And I really want you to think about how everything connects. Uh, section three, we'll go over teleconnections and global U.S. impacts. We'll really just skim through that. I know you've had some experience with the LCAT tool and, and looking at that. And then um, in section four, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the application to monitoring prediction at CPC um, and in the Weather Service. So ENSO, in a nutshell, uh, it basically, it's an, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly that O is for oscillation, but the important thing is to remember that it's not a regular oscillation. It's very irregular. Um, it's a, a shift between warm El Nino or La Nina, which is cool conditions in the tropical Pacific Ocean. And so in the figure below, we see a single case study from uh, 97, 98 El Nino on the left there. Uh, in warmer and above average sea surface temperatures, or SSTs, shown there. And then uh, in the La Nina case, we see blues or below average sea surface temperatures in that region. And uh, it's uh, naturally occurring, so it's been around really for um, hundreds of thousands of years, basically. And uh, it, it, it's important to keep in mind that the ocean and the atmosphere change together. So it is associated with changes in the circulation and rainfall. Um, and however, though, we do monitor our official index is for sea surface temperatures, um, the departures from average in this region, what we call the Nino 3.4 region. And so you can create an index, which is shown at the bottom here, um, that tracks uh, the ENSO changes. And that region is, is selected because it, it does have fairly strong coupling with the atmospheric circulation in the tropical Pacific. On average, events last about 9 to 12 months. Uh, El Ninos, in particular, don't last much beyond that. However, La Ninos can persist much longer for multiple years. And um, both, uh, generally, though, peak during the Northern Hemisphere winter. OK, so I like this slide a lot because this is showing um, the total sea surface temperatures. And so even though we track El Nino and La Nino's with the anomalies or the departure from average, it's important to keep in mind that there's a seasonal cycle that's quite strong across the tropical Pacific. And one thing you'll notice right away is that the warmest sea surface temperatures tends to be in the western Pacific. Um, and then during El Nino periods, essentially those warm sea surface temperatures extend across the entire tropical Pacific. So if you watch this, you can see that it, uh, it stretches across the whole basin. That's our El Nino. And then at one point during this animation, you'll see the blues here. That's our, our La Nina. And you'll also see the strong north-south progression of the sea surface temperatures. And that's really um, the solar cycle. So um, you know, when the solar heating becomes greatest in the northern hemisphere, the warm pool, the Pacific warm pool, as it's called in the western Pacific, shifts to the north. Um, and then when solar cycle is, is strongest in the southern hemisphere, then uh, the warm pool shifts to the south. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, the total sea surface temperatures is ultimately what the atmosphere feels. So often we, even though we're looking and measuring using the departure, it's important to know what's going on in the total sea surface temperatures. OK, so I'm going to march through each variable one by one. This is showing rainfall or precipitation before El Nino in the top row here and La Nina in the bottom row. On the first column here is the total precipitation. And then the second column here is the departures in precipitation. And so El Ninos, you tend to have, because the warmest sea surface temperatures are stretching across the tropical Pacific, rainfall and convection is also expanding eastward across the tropical Pacific. So these greens are showing the enhanced rainfall you get in the central and eastern Pacific. And the browns are showing where you have actually suppressed rainfall. But it's important to keep in mind the rainfall is not turning off. 
it's just uh, less rainier than average. And then the bottom is uh, La Nina. In La Nina case, since you have those cooler than average waters um, extending into the central Pacific, you get a suppression or a reduced rainfall in the tropical Pacific with an enhancement um, over Indonesia. We also um, can measure El Nino La Nina using sea level pressure. This is showing the southern oscillation. Uh, it is often referred to um, as the atmospheric component or, or SLP historically. During El Ninos, you tend to have uh, lower than average sea level pressure across the eastern part of the basin, higher than average sea level pressure across uh, Indonesia and vice versa during La Nina. So this kind of slosh of mass back and forth in this east-west configuration is referred to as the southern oscillation. We can also uh, measure El Nino and La Nina using both the low-level winds and also uh, the subsurface temperatures, which are often tracked using um, the thermocline as a metric. Now, thermocline is kind of a jargony phrase, but all it, all it is is this basically the area where the, sea, where the subsurface temperature uh, difference between the warmer, more mixed layer near the surface and then the colder water at depth is the greatest. So where this difference is the greatest is where approximately where the thermocline is located. And so during La Nina, the thermocline tends to be closer to the surface in the eastern Pacific. Um, and that makes some sense because the waters are now below average in the eastern Pacific as well. And that's reflecting that enhanced upwelling um, and, and thermocline that's really touching the surface during a La Nina state. At the same time, the trade winds, which normally blow from east to west across the tropical Pacific, during La Nina are enhanced. So in a way, you can think of the trade winds as literally pushing water away from the coast of South America and, and shifting it uh, and pushing it toward uh, the western part of the Pacific. And so the trade winds are blowing even stronger during La Nina. The thermocline is closer to the surface. During El Nino, you have an opposite situation where the thermocline is actually deeper than average, um, and, the, and, and the sea surface temperatures and the warmer uh, part of the mixed layer is essentially extended across the entire tropical Pacific. Um, and at the same time, the trade winds, which normally blow from east to west, are now weaker than average. We tend to see westerly wind anomalies in the El Nino situation. And so deeper than average thermocline and westerly wind anomalies um, are quite common during El Nino. This is showing the subsurface temperatures. I like the top panel a lot because uh, it shows roughly where the thermocline is located. And the thermocline is usually um, this 20 degrees C isotherm that you can see. Um, and uh, ultimately, we're seeing both an El Nino and La Nina state here in this animation. And you can see the La Nina state very clearly when the thermocline uh, becomes uh, close to the surface. These blues and the upwelling becomes much stronger in the eastern Pacific. Here's our La Nina case coming in right here. And then the El Nino case is when the warmest waters are actually expanding to the east and the thermocline becomes much deeper in the eastern Pacific. So there's your El Nino case right here. And you can also look at this in terms of the anomalies. Uh, below average subsurface temperatures is indicative of a La Nina. And above average subsurface temperatures right there is the R El Nino case. OK, so we just went through each variable one by one. In this next section, I want to focus on linking all these variables together. And one of the really critical concepts here is that ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, is both the ocean and the atmosphere. They're in sync. It's actually very tough to see where El Nino's uh, and La Nina start. Um, ultimately, sometimes it's the ocean that starts forcing the atmosphere. Um, and there's other instances where the atmosphere seems to uh, slightly precede the ocean. Because they're coupled and so locked together, it's very hard to see uh, which, which is exerting uh, a, a forcing on the other variable, because they're, they're in sync. And often, you'll hear this term, the Yerkney's feedback. Um, and ultimately, this is just uh, 
indicating the positive feedback that is occurring between the ocean and the atmosphere over the equatorial Pacific. And so uh, positive feedback just means there's a kind of mutual reinforcement of the initial anomaly. And so this is one example, and I just kind of threw together a, a little schematic here. And so an example of this, this Yerkney's feedback, this positive feedback, is that in stage one, for whatever reason, we'll start seeing a stronger east-west temperature gradient across the tropical Pacific. So you can think of this cold here in the, in the eastern Pacific um, and the warm conditions in the western Pacific. And as a result of a stronger SST gradient, so the cold is becoming colder, the warm is becoming warmer, you will get stronger winds connecting the two regions. Um, so the warm area, you can think of more rising motion. Cold area tend to have more sinking motion. And as a result of continuity, you have to have stronger winds blowing between the two regions. So, and then um, because you have stronger winds, you will actually reinforce the initial stronger SST gradient. So this is our positive feedback. And so how does stronger winds uh, feed back onto the sea surface temperature? Well, if you think about it, stronger winds are going to help push um, that water across the tropical Pacific, it piles up. And because you're, you're, this water is traveling across the tropical Pacific, it is warming up over time due to solar radiation. And then because you can't have a big hole left in the eastern Pacific, the, the water has to come from somewhere if you're pushing it to the west at the surface. And that water comes from depth, and, and that comes from deeper below the ocean in this upwelling zone. And so cold water is upwelling here. And so you can, if you think about it, the cold water is now replacing the water at the surface, and you're going to actually reinforce that region of cooling. So stronger winds in this case by transporting water across the tropical Pacific is now reinforcing the SST gradient. So this is an example of the positive feedback where the initial stronger SST gradient is then reinforced. And this accounts for the growth and persistence of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. One of the reasons it has such a lasting effect is because of this positive feedback. And a positive feedback equivalently can be the opposite case, where you have a weaker SST gradient, which leads to weaker winds. These weaker winds can lead to a weaker SST gradient. So it's this uh, kind of to and fro between these two variables that are mutually reinforcing and, and really allows for El Nino and La Nina to arise um, in the uh, tropical Pacific. So I haven't gone over this as much as I probably should have at this point, but you might be asking yourself, OK, I understand El Nino is this warming uh, and La Nina is this cooling, but what does, the, what does the tropical Pacific normally look like? Well, the normal condition of a tropical Pacific is for cooler conditions in the eastern part of the basin. You can look at either figure in this case. So uh, you, know, you tend to have this upwelling zone near South America. Uh, the trade winds are blowing, uh, are easterly, blowing from east to west, and then helping transport uh, water to the western part. It's actually piling up here. The sea level is a little bit higher in the western Pacific here. Because the warmer SSTs in this region, you tend to have more latent heating and more deep uh, cumulus convection. Um, this whole atmosphere kind of overturning circulation is referred to as the Walker circulation. And so um, even in the normal state, you actually see coupling between the trade winds and the SSTs. This SST gradient is helping maintain the trade winds. But one of the reasons the trade winds exist to begin with is because of the SST gradient. So that's our coupled state. And I like flipping to the La Nina state because first, after then showing the normal state, because it's actually, if I flip back and forth, you can see that La Nina is, is just sort of an amplified La Nina case. It's like uh, normal on, on, on steroids. And so 
Uh, here in this case, the sea surface temperature gradient is even stronger. The thermocline is closer to the surface. We're seeing below average uh, sea surface temperatures extending across the tropical Pacific. Because you have the stronger gradient between the east and west, the trade winds are blowing stronger than average. You have even more convection than average over Indonesia and the western Pacific. Our walker circulation as a result is dew stops. And so you can think of La Nina as this reinforced normal state. Uh, El Nino, by contrast, is a complete breakdown of the normal state. So typically, the trade winds are blowing from east to west. In the El Nino case, those trade winds are now much, much weaker. Uh, you'll definitely see westerly wind anomalies at low levels in the tropical Pacific. Uh, for really strong El Nino, you'll actually see the mean trade winds sh shift direction, so a co complete collapse of the trade winds. And if you think about it, these trade winds are helping pile up that warm water in the western Pacific. Well, now that's that 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 pressure or that forcing to force that, that water across the Pacific is now not there. So as a result, the warm water starts sloshing eastward across the tropical Pacific. Thermocline is deepening. You see less of a sea surface temperature gradient. Um, and of course, a lesser gradient is a positive feedback on the trade winds. You have to have uh, weaker trade winds uh, being reinforced. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet, but keep in the back of your mind, is that the location of the of, of where this convection sets up. So the convection now that is warming across the tropical Pacific will expand eastward, but its eastward extent of the convection um, is determined by the total sea surface temperatures. This is one of the reasons why it's important to track the climatology in addition to the departure, is that convection really only likes regions where uh, it tends to be greater than about 28 degrees C. OK, so here's some quick features. You've already heard some of this, um, but we'll quickly go over them again to reinforce is that the ENSO cycle is irregular. Um, it occurs every two to seven years, but that can really shift around. And of course, this is flipped between El Nino state and the cold, cold La Nina state. Uh, episodes generally form during the spring or summer. This isn't a rule. Um, there are definitely exceptions to the rule, but generally forms during the spring or summer. They peak during the winter and decay during the following spring. But La Nina episodes actually um, will last on occasion multiple years. So uh, the maximum that we've seen is about three years. This is much, much less common for El Nino, which really on its maximum duration is somewhere around 18 months. Uh, for whatever reason, we tend to see uh, stronger El Nino events are often followed by La Nina. I think the frequency in our 60-year record is something like 50% of the time when you have a strong El Nino event, it will be followed by La Nina. Uh, we also, there's kind of an asymmetry in the anomaly strength. So stronger El Nino episodes tend to have a greater departure from climatology uh, compared to La Nina episodes, which have a uh, you know slightly weaker departure from climatology. Okay, and at this point, I'm going to go ahead and pause and queue up our first poll question. And I, because we we do have these time limits, I I, I uh, only want to give you about a minute. So if you could quickly, um, after Lon puts that on the screen, do it. Okay, our poll question is showing. If everyone will just uh, take a moment to read it and make a choice. OK, and it would be great if you wrapped up here and make a quick guess if, um, at this point. And go ahead and prompt. All right, here we go. Close it. OK, you guys are really on top of things. This is great. Um, the correct answer is if you have those enhanced easterly winds, so those trade winds blowing from east to west, the thermocline in the eastern Pacific will actually be shallower, it will be closer to the surface. This is 
indicative of La Nina. Very good job, guys. Um, at this point, I want to quickly ask if anyone has any questions on those first two, um, two bullet points. We'll be talking a little bit more about impacts and monitoring prediction in the, in the last half here. But I want to make sure that the, the coupling is understandable. Um, is, did I say anything that was confusing to you? Just raise your hand if you have any questions. I have a question from Jay Crouch. Let me just unmute the audio here. The conference is now in talk mode. Um, hi, Michelle. This is uh, Jay Crouch at NCDC. Hi, how's it going? I'm good. Thanks for uh, doing this. I have a quick question about um, the calculation of the sea surface temperature departure from average. I know that recently the CPC changed their base period from the 71 to 2010, excuse me, 71 to 2000 period to the 1981 to 2010 period. And how does that change the base period change the, uh, the frequency or occurrence of El Nino, uh, of El Nino and La Nina? And with the cooler sea surface temperatures in the Pacific right now, would we be in a La Nina if we are still using the old base period? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. Um, for those on the line that might not quite understand the ins and outs of what Jake's um, referring to, I'm going to go ahead and skip to a, a slide that is, shows up later. So um, I kind of quickly alluded to that our main monitoring region for uh, ENSO is this near 3.4 area of the East Central Pacific. And so you can take the departure from average and create a time series out of that. And this is showing a time series going back all the way to 1950 uh, to the present. And so El Nino cases are where uh, that region becomes greater than a half degree centigrade above average. La Nina cases where it's cooler than about minus 0.5 degrees centigrade uh, before average. And what Jake is uh, pointing out is that recently we went through a base period change where um, ultimately the most recent period is being corrected by the 1981 uh, through 2010 30-year base period. And how does that change the entire index? Um, and this is a really interesting question and it's something that we talked about a lot at CPC and with our partners at the IRI. Because what we realized when we shifted to effectively a warmer climatology, so across the tropical Pacific, if you were to look at the trends in the 60 year, um, it is quite warm across the tropical Pacific. So if your base period, your mean state is becoming warmer over time, and you're defining your El Nino and La Nina episodes as a departure from that, um, you know, certainly there's going to be some influence on the historical record. So what we ended up doing is creating a shifting 30-year base period. I'm not going to go into the details, but now we're correcting and using the base periods um, that were in place at the time. Um, so in the, in the 1950s, we would use uh, a base period that's actually centered um, back in the in the historical record from like the you know 1935 to 19 you know uh, you know it's the uh, 60s, and so um, ultimately this was a, a fairly big change. You can go to our webpage to read more about that. Um, Jake, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you did. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on here. Oh. Um, can we, just in the interest of time, hold off on that question um, just to make sure I can get through the um, next couple s sections? Okay. Um, oh, and then, okay, sorry, Jeff, we'll try to get uh, back to questions. That question, we might have time for it, but I definitely want to make sure I get through the whole presentation. The conference is now in silent mode. Okay. All right, so in this next section, uh, teleconnections. Oh, darn it. Why is it not showing up? It seems to be frozen. On this side. Okay. Okay, but I want to go back. Okay. Yeah, I need to go back. Okay. I don't know why it didn't work. It wasn't syncing. Okay. All right. So here is teleconnections, and um, 
really quickly, I, I really like the schematic. I know it's a little old, but ultimately what it shows is very easily a depiction of how tropical convection can lead to this kind of global wave train or ENSO teleconnection as we call it. And so this gray shaded region, you can think of this as convection and rainfall being uh, basically uh, expanding eastward. And as a result of this enhanced convection, what you do is you perturb the tropical circulation in a way that you have increased upper level divergence. If you think back to dynamics, if you have increased upper level divergence, it will start taking on um, a, a uh, rightward curl in the uh, northern hemisphere. And so you'll get this anticyclone in the subtropics. In the, in the southern hemisphere, uh, you know, its leftward curl. And so you set up this anticyclonic couplet straddling the equator in a condition where of El Nino where you have this enhanced rainfall. And because your, your, your jet stream is now extending further out across the tropical Pacific in part due to this anticyclone, downstream of that you tend to see more troughing and then uh, the defluent zone of the jet will then cause uh, uh, anticyclonic anomaly um, across the uh, North America and so on and so forth. You can think of the atmosphere as very similar to if you were to take a rock and really uh, throw it hard into the water, you'll get this downstream ripple effect. The same thing is happening uh, in, in the case of tropical convection being perturbed. Okay. So I'm not going to go into uh, these in detail. This is showing the impacts. These are nice schematics. Ultimately, what we see is impacts tend to be more extensive across the globe during the northern hemisphere winter. This is because El Nino and La Niños tend to achieve their maximum amplitude then during that period. Uh, during the uh, northern hemisphere summer or southern hemisphere uh, winter, the impacts tend to be a little bit more restricted to southern hemisphere. This is true in both the case of El Nino and La Nina impacts. Um, and I'll leave it to you to spend more time to look at those global impacts later. And so uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and go to our next slide here because uh, that previous slide will be reinforced. But ultimately, uh, El Nino La Nina is having a very pronounced change on the typical wintertime circulation. This is showing the jet stream. Um, I know it's hard to see, but this is North America right here. Um, and here's Australia. And ultimately, this colored area is the jet stream at about 200 millibars. And during the El Nino case, you can see the, almost this very zonal extension across um, the uh, Pacific North America. And then during La Nina, actually, the jet stream is very different over the P North Pacific. Jet stream is attracted back a little bit to the west here. And there's a big break in the North Pacific. We actually tend to see more ridging here. And you can see the streamlines are becoming a little bit more wavier. And so the La Nina case, you tend to have a more wavy circulation. Um, in the El Nino case, you tend to have a more zonal circulation, this east-west stretching of the, of the winds across the Pacific North American region. So keep that in the back of your mind. And it's important to realize that there will be event-to-event -event differences. This is showing different El Nino cases for JFM. All of these are showing a different El Nino case. And you know, you can see the strong zonal jet stream that's actually shifted a little bit more equatorward than average. I know it's hard to see, but it is shifted a little bit more equatorward. Um, and certainly there's, there's small differences in each cases, but um, more or less that zonal equatorward shifted jet stream is, is fairly, fairly consistent. Compare that to the r rather drastic change that you get during El La Nina, and I'll flip back and forth so hopefully you can see that big change. Um, La Nina, your more wavy jet stream, you can see the streamlines are, are becoming more meridional. Um, so meridional just means more north-south. And uh, the jet stream becomes more attracted over uh, the Asia. It's hard to see here, but the jet stream is also shifting a little bit more poleward than average during a La Nina case. So it's not quite as equatorward as in the El Nino case. And so a more wavy pattern. And look over North America, see how different jet stream can be from case to case. Okay, so here's another schematic 
Uh, El Nino tends to be more zonal jet stream that therefore you have wetter than average conditions typically over the southern tier of the United States because you have a more zonal jet stream. Uh, low pressure tends to set up in the Gulf of Alaska. If you think of the flow as this big cyclonic anomaly, you're actually going to hinder cold air outbreaks. And so the, the, the northern part of North America tends to be warmer than average because the flow is opposite uh, uh, of where the cold air outbreaks would typically kind of flow down over the contiguous United States. This jet stream tends to also drag the storm track a little bit to the southeast, and so it tends to be drier over the Ohio and Tennessee Valley during uh, El Nino case. La Nina is a very much the opposite. You tend to have more troughing in the, in the North Pacific. Um, as a result, the flow will actually uh, be more conducive to cold air outbreaks across the northern tier. You can think of the flow um, just kind of being pushed along here. Um, because the jet stream is more poleward um, and it tends to be wetter than average over the Pacific Northwest, uh, across the southern tier, because now we have this polar shifted jet stream, tends to be drier and warmer than average. OK. Um, and I'm going to go ahead, since we only have um, roughly about uh, 30 minutes here, go through this last section. And I'm hoping toward the end here, we'll have more time for questions. We'll have another poll. And then hopefully, we'll open this up to even more questions. So. Jot down um, your notes if you have any questions on that section three. OK, so in this section, we're going to go over what the CPC definitions are. We sort of already hit on that, so I'll probably go through that pretty quickly. Uh, I'll briefly introduce you to the alert system. And then we're going to zero in and talk a little bit about forecasting and so what we look at and what the model skill is. Um, and then I'm going to give you two tools um, at uh, CPC. It's on the CPC webpage that gives you an idea of impacts. You can certainly also use the LCAT tool that Marina has gone over. Um, it's just another resource for you. And then the last slide will go over climate change and ENSO. So we, we sort of already went through this thanks to Jake's question. Um, the official ENSO index is this Nino 3.4 region. Um, anything that is greater than about half degree centigrade or up above average is uh, considered an El Nino episode. Anything that's less than about minus 0.5 degree C average is considered a La Nina episode. And one thing I want you to see in this index, all right, that so anything above this red line is generally considered an El Nino. Anything below this blue line is generally considered La Nina. And one thing I want you to notice is how from decade to decade, so this starts in 1950 and goes to the present, um, how much the variability can change, all right? So in this period, you can see there's almost kind of flatter uh, variability, so less in here. Whereas if you get into the 80s and 90s, you actually see some really drastic swings. The frequency can also change from year to year. Um, in fact, the most recent period, the last 10 years, one thing that has been very noticeable to me is how much we've been swinging back and forth between El Nino and La Nina states. So the variability or the, the number of transitions that we've seen in the last 10 years has actually been quite high. Um, it's really almost comparable to a period that we saw in the 60s. Um, so it's, it it's really is interesting to look at these historical indices and, and evaluate how the character has changed. We only calculate the ONI back to 1950 because uh, the error becomes much, much greater over the tropical Pacific. We have a harder time, um, quite frankly, trusting the data because there's much more uncertainty. So we generally are a little bit more cautious and we cut it off around 1950. As you can imagine, if you go into the modern era, it becomes more and more reliable. OK, so the NOAA ENSO Outlook, um, CPC is providing a weekly update. This is uh, on our website every Monday. And it's really just kind of a quick uh, overview of the different variables um, in our lab, which will be the last 30 minutes of this time slot. We'll go through one of these weekly updates. Um, and, and I'll have you guys answering a series of questions. Um, and then our, but our real, like our primary vehicle for updating the status of El Nino La Nina is this ENSO diagnostics discussion, which is released once a month on Thursday between the 4th and 10th of each month. And it's with this release that the ENSO alert system also gets updated. And you might be asking what the ENSO alert system is. Well, um, this has been in place for several years now. Um, a El Nino La Nina watch is uh, when 
conditions are favorable, they are looking good for potential development of ENSO within the next six months. An advisory means that uh, El Nino, La Nina is present and currently observed and expected to continue. And a final advisory is issued when conditions have ended. We are presently in NA, which basically means not active. So none of these conditions apply. And you can receive monthly notifications by subscribing to this website. There's no spam. You just get one email a month. OK, so what is the criteria for an ENSO advisory? I already went over the ONI, our index. Now, our index, and I just realized in, in talking here that um, I forgot to mention the ONI is a three-month average, and it's a running average. So that helps smooth out the index and, and the variability that you would see on a month-to-month -month basis. And it, it brings it closer to um, seasonal ENSO timescales. And so the ONI is a three-month running average, which is actually really hard to use in real-time operations. Sometimes we see a fairly decisive shift in El Nino and La Nina that we need to get in front of. We know this thing is moving, and we're not going to wait three months to essentially declare the onset. So for that reason, we have sort of an in-between um, uh, conditions statement here. And conditions means that uh, we're witnessing a one-month average in Nino 3.4 greater than 0.5 degrees C in El Nino state case, and then uh, less than minus 0.5 degrees C in the La Nino case. So we only look for this one month. We also, um, in order for conditions to be issued, we have to expect the forecast, there's almost a forecast component here. You have to expect that the three-month only uh, threshold will eventually be met. So if we don't believe it will persist, then we will not issue conditions. We're also looking for a third feature, which is that atmospheric response, both the winds and the ORs. Remember, El Nino La Nina is not just the oceans, also the atmosphere. We're looking for those typical responses uh, that you expect over the equatorial Pacific. So when all three of these uh, criteria are met, then we will, on occasion, issue El Nino or La Nina conditions, despite the fact the ONI has not been quite, has been satisfied. This allows us to issue ENSO advisories in real time. OK, so what tools do we use to predict ENSO? Here's a snapshot of some of the figures that we stare at on a month-to-month -month basis. This is showing consolidation of several different tools at CPC, CCA, Markov. Um, and then we have CFS version 2. Um, and then finally, here on the right is one of the more popular products, the IRI CPC ENSO plume, uh, which shows each, each uh, model here. Uh, both dynamical and statistical models. And what, what are these dynamical and statistical models? Well, um, as m many of you probably know, dynamical models are essentially run on large supercomputers, uh, very uh, complex mathematical equations that describe these physical relationships. And they also include parameterizations of features that uh, can't be resolved on a grid point by grid point basis, like convection. And, and a, prime example of this is CFS, or the Climate Forecast System, which is run at NSEP. And that's considered what we call a Tier 1 coupled model. Remember, uh, ENSO is both the ocean and atmosphere together. So having a coupled model is nice because it allows the ocean and the atmosphere to interact uh, uh, more freely. Statistical models, literally, you can run these on your laptop. They're not, uh, a supercomputer is not required at all. Um, they're based on empirical relationships um, or empirical uh, historical relationships that we see over, say, the past 60 uh, years. And so some examples are shown here. And then finally, um, this has become very uh, in vogue in recent years, which is multi-model combinations, or sometimes you'll hear MME, which is multi-model ensemble. And so these are the various processes that we use to combine dynamical and statistical models. A very simple way to create an MME is to take all your dynamical models and average them together. And when you do that, uh, the performance of the average tends to be, on the aggregate, slightly better than any individual model component. 
So that's why MME has become popular is that um, ultimately people feel that it is slightly more uh, uh, skillful uh, measure. And th but there's certainly many different ways other than just a raw average that you can use. Uh, Dave Unger at CPC uses this ensemble regression to uh, create uh, his MME. Okay, so I just went through all the different tools that we have and uh, uh, how, how do we create our probabilities associated with it? How do we create our forecast? Well, we'll take, we'll sit down, the forecasters will sit down, look at all the analysis and look at um, the various tools and they will each individually on their own come probabilities for the three different outcomes uh, shown in here, red is El Nino, uh, blue is La Nina, green is, is neutral, and probability is shown on the y-axis. And so each forecaster sits down does this going out to about, you know, eight leads. And, um, and then uh, there's about eight forecasters on the team. What we do is we average them together to create the consensus probability. And the latest consensus probability is shown here. This is from early July of this year. And as you can see right now, we're expecting neutral conditions to continue into the 2013 and 14 winter. Uh, you know, and, and actually we're in the process of now updating this. We have another ENSO release coming up next Thursday, and so this, this plot will change. And you can access this plot from the ENSO diagnostic discussion. There's actually a link within the discussion. Okay, so now I'm going to shift a little bit. That's how we create our forecast and talk a little bit about the features that we see in ENSO model performance. Um, in particular, dynamical models seem to have, in the last 10 years, slightly done better than statistical models. Models continue to have problems with timing and amplitude. That's so getting the exact month of the transition and also the exact intensity of El Nino La Nina is still very problematic and it's very tricky with a lot of, a lot of uh, range that we have to express. Um, and then finally, uh, transitions, interestingly enough, when there's a very strong El Nino, La Nina brewing, we tend to better predict those than transitions to weaker events. And the spring prediction barrier um, will be reinforced in the next slides. Basically, forecasts before the spring tend to have lower skill or lower, we have lower confidence in them. And this is showing a plot from a paper of Barnson et al. Um, last year, and it shows this, was just one model, this is a climate forecast system for the, over the last 10 years. And it's showing anomaly correlation, all right? So it's between zero and one. Anything that's in red here is anomaly correlations, you know, around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, which is pretty good. That means your model is capturing the observations, you know, uh, 60 to 80% of the variance roughly. And, um, and uh, in, this, in this particular figure, the x-axis is showing the target of the season we're predicting. The y-axis is showing the lead time in the prediction. Zero is uh, the uh, more instantaneous prediction for the following season uh, going out to, uh, I think this is showing out to uh, seven leads. We didn't, this darker gray means there wasn't enough data to show the skill. And ultimately, you see that the skill can be pretty good um, when during the winter um, and the fall, but there's this big kind of hole here. And this is basically the manifestation of the seasonal prediction or the spring uh, uh, barrier. And um, really, you have to get through um, this period in order to have a lot of confidence in your prediction. So usually when we come out, out of the spring and summer, so roughly about after June, we start to have a little bit more confidence in the model forecast. Uh, the root mean squared error, um, so this is, tends to be an indic indicator of error in amplitude, is somewhere around half degree centigrade to one degree centigrade. This is quite large. Remember, El Nino is, is determined with thresholds of about half degree centigrade. So this is sort of implying the, the issues that we have in getting the ultimate intensity of El Ninos and La Ninos. Here is showing the um, 
uh, many, many different models. CFS is shown right here, so it's the exact same as what you saw in the previous slide, but showing all the other dynamical and forecast models over the last 10 years. The ones in the orange box are the statistical model predictions. And one thing I want you to notice from this is statistical models tend to have much more pronounced spring barriers, so this these deep Vs. Dynamical models are actually edging out the statistical models in part because they're doing better with the spring barrier. And part of the reason for that, we believe, is dynamical models are initialized more frequently. CFS is run every day, so it's using an observed state and making a forecast, whereas the statistical models are often using monthly or seasonal average data, so they are not updated as frequently. And as a result, we uh, tend to see a little bit more severe uh, spring barriers because ultimately ENSO tends to be in transition during the spring months. So if you're in, in transition, you want to be sampling and understanding what's going on in the tropical Pacific as, as, as much as you can. So for that reason, we are starting to see a slight uh, improvement in the dynamical models. For the uh, northern hemisphere winter predictions, uh, both statistical and dynamical models are more comparable. OK, this is kind of an interesting concept. I think uh, I, when I tell this to people, they have to kind of think about it. So don't, don't worry if you don't get this right away. But ultimately, the, the variability of El Nino and La Nino, remember I was showing some periods some decades where we see really large variability in El Nino and La Nina, and there's some decades where we see much more reduced variability. So the swings between El Nino and La Nina tend to be less. Well, interestingly enough, the model skill is a function of how much ENSO variability there is. So this is showing a diagram showing the skill, the anomaly correlation, next to the historical variance in ENSO. And ultimately, decades where um, we see less model skill are associated with decades with smaller swings in Nino 3.4, so smaller uh, El Nino Lani events. Where we see skill is greater tends to be those decades where we see very strong El Nino and La Ninas. All right, so more recently, going up to real time, this is centered in 2005. So in the last decade, we're actually going through a period where our model skill has worsened. And it's not because the models aren't getting better. There's a lot of scientists working very hard on the models. Um, and certainly, we are seeing model improvements. But you can't see it because it's masked out by the observed decadal ENSO variability. So this is really important to keep in mind that, that the background state and just natural swings in ENSO can have a huge impact upon how skillful our model predictions are. And this is another point I want to touch on is that natural variability in ENSO is very large. This is showing the length of the ONI record here. So this is Nino 3.4 for the 60-year period. This is when we look at and compare ENSO events. We're only looking at the, the small snapshot shown here in the top right. And during, um, if you were to take a model run with no, you know, forcing, so there's no external forcings like greenhouse gases or anything like that, you'll see very strong decadal um, fluctuations in El Nino, La Nina. This is showing 2,000-year control simulation. And you'll see snapshots. See, this is our length of our ONI record. That's very similar. Um, there's a similar case here, this M6 uh, period uh, that is quite similar. But you'll see other snapshots that are very different. So here's M5. You can see there's very little ENSO variability in this particular period. And this is occurring naturally. All right? There's other periods where we see very regular swings between El Nino and La Nina. Um, here we see really strong El Nino events occurring so often. So this, this, this is uh, interesting because it shows how a 60-year record is not enough really to sample um, many ENSO statistics. In particular, not only does the time, um, you know, the, the time series change a lot in association with El Nino La Ninas, uh, but we also see kind of changes in the spatial structure. So during the 80s and 90s, when we had much stronger El Nino events, we saw uh, the SSTs were expanded across the tropical Pacific more. We saw this Eastern Pacific or cold tongue El Nino or conventional canonical El Nino. So the expanse of the anomaly went all the way to South America. 
But in contrast, during, since 2000, we've actually been seeing structures of El Nino that are slightly um, different, that are more focused on the central Pacific, and they tend to be also weaker events. These are referred to as central Pacific El Ninos, or warm pool El Ninos. Sometimes you'll hear Madoki, or Dateline El Nino. And um, here's an example. This is 2009 and 10 El Nino, which was actually quite strong. If you look at Nino 3.4, this was a fairly strong event. But the center and the warmest anomalies is not extending all the way to the coast of South America in this case. It's more focused in the central Pacific. So there's a lot of natural variations and ends that are important and have consequences for what we see in the tropical Pacific. OK, I'm not going to have time because I do want to give you a chance to ask questions to go over the specifics of these composites. Um, but ultimately, we do have these on our website for every single season, both El Nino and La, La Nina for temperature and precipitation. If you look at the top left, this is your composite in both of these figures. So uh, this is uh, greens are showing where we have increased rainfall, browns has decreased. There's a frequency, which basically shows how often that anomaly occurs in the, in, in the, in the plot to the left. Um, and you can see in the El Nino case, uh, more rainfall across the west and also in the south and across the southern tier here. You also see below average conditions across the southern tier. Um, sorry, below average temperatures across southern tier during an El Nino case. And uh, so these are, can be very useful when you're trying to diagnose uh, whether uh, what, what sort of ENSO impact that you can expect. Uh, the second row is showing trends, and the bottom row is showing uh, kind of a synthesis of the composite plus the trend. The box plot is another way you can kind of visualize ENSO impacts. Um, this is showing a specific region in eastern Carolinas, and it's showing the range of precipitation that you would expect with El Nino neutral and La Nina. And what's nice is it's, it's not in terms of the departure. This is a, essentially precipitation in this region in terms of total. And where you see the blue box is where that, that you know, uh, central tercile is located. Um, so the upper one-third of cases is this upper whisker, lower one-third is this lower whisker. And you can see the shift um, in the rainfall amounts uh, for El Nino neutral and La Nina. All right, final slide here. Um, will ENSO change due to climate change? This is a very common question. At this time, and I'm, I'm citing a report from uh, IPCC AR4, and you may know that uh, AR5 is coming out later this year. So certainly we should all pay attention to what they come up with. I, I actually am sort of speculating that we'll see a similar statement. Um, there's been a lot of research on this topic, and it's definitely come up with a lot of interesting questions, but I don't, I don't think anything has been shown to be uh, very likely. Um, and part of the problem here is that the models continue to not agree on how ENSO changes in a warmer environment. Um, you know, and it's my opinion that at the feedbacks so the, the different feedbacks or components and so will probably change with warming. But it's possible that the feedbacks will cancel out between each other. And it's going to be very, very hard to see which terms will dominate, uh, which ones will be weaker. And for that reason, the statement is that there's no consistent indication that there will be changes in ENSO amplitude or frequency in the 20th, 21st century. But one thing to keep in mind is ENSO variability will continue to exist in the future, even with anthropogenic climate change. And so here's our summary slide. I'm not going to read this out loud. Um, you can see it uh, right here. Um, but with that, I think we have about six minutes for questions. And then we'll go ahead and we'll progress to our lab, which will be a little bit more interactive. I'm going to be calling on you, so you're definitely going to want to pay attention during the lab. But um, uh, we can go back and revisit any of these slides. Um, hopefully, you've been jotting down any questions or notes that you have. Go ahead. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, to start out with um, Jeff Craven, you had a question. Yes, uh, I, I've seen anomalies for 850 millibar winds with these circulations such as ENSO and MJO. When you say that easterly trades are enhanced, uh, 
how, what does that equate to at the surface? Um, are we talking about a half a knot, a knot, five knots stronger? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we actually sort of think of it in terms of meters per second. Um, I would have to uh, go to Google and translate that to knots. Um, but ultimately, uh, we see, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the maximum is, so during 97, 98, but, um, you know, often we'll see amplitudes like around four meters per second above average. I'm going back, so hopefully we can... I think we have. It, you just multiply by two, so that's eight knots. That's that's a lot bigger than I was expecting to hear. Yeah, I unfortunately, I I think at one time I had a slide in here, but I think it got it got chopped. Um, so I I instead of being all ambiguous and wish wash it, I'll um, uh, post something on the Comet website, kind of giving a, a range of what we've seen. And the the other comment I have is when, when you compared the typical El Nino uh, temperature anomaly that goes all the way to the coast of South America and the one that where it was the warm pool, uh, you had a variation of two to three times on the increment. So I would recommend having the same interval so that you're comparing apples to apples. Wait, what are you talking about? There was a graphic that had tenth of a degree intervals in temperature anomaly, and then it was 0.25 for the other graph. So the other graph would, by definition, have less contrast on it because it had I want to show this. Yeah, um, if, if you could, you could, because um, I, I, unfortunately, I'm having a sinking problem um, so I can't even, yeah, uh, so uh, with regards to the plotting, um, you know, certainly just send me an email and, and we can, we can adjust that. Alrighty. Because I, I'm not sure which, which one you're referring to. So I, I have no idea. Okay. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, from Richard in Asheville, could you go into more detail to discuss the trend map on the inside temperature precipitation composite map webpage? Um, oh, you're you're vocalizing the question. Well, no, it's the uh, CPC website that shows the temperature precipitation composites, the impact of El Nino or La Nina on the temperature precip frequency. You have three map. It's six maps, two, uh, three rows two maps on each row. Top is the anomalies, uh, let's see, the top is the composite, but middle is the trend, and the bottom is the composite, put that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we are showing it now. Yes. Yeah, what's, what's your question regarding it? Could you go into more detail as to how the sure. trend map sure. is computed? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, if you go to this website, there is a tab that will very, um, it, it has a written README file associated with this. So um, I'm going to kind of quickly go through it, but um, ultimately you can go to the web page and click the information tab and you'll get m further explanation. So the top is showing um, the composite based on El Nino, La Nina. So this is showing an anomaly of precipitation. Um, and uh, it is an average of these 22 cases at the bottom. So we list the years, DJF, El Nino that we're including into this composite. And so here's the anomaly. On the right is the frequency, which basically counts, in, and this is expressed in percentage terms, how often these anomalies occur. So in the case of, um, let's say, let's look at Florida. All right, so Florida has above average rainfall in this region. And what the plot on the right is showing is that above average occurs in roughly about uh, 60 to 70% of these years that are listed down here. So you'll get wetter than average condition in 60 to 70% of those years. The trend is actually what we call optimal um, climate normals, or OCN. So um, in the case of rainfall, this is showing the last 15-year average of, of, uh, of, of rainfall. In temperature case, the trend is actually the last 10-year average. And so um, this is independent of El Nino and La Nina variation. It's just the trend of what we've seen. 
The bottom is, is essentially, it's not a straight uh, summation of the top and middle plot. Uh, there's actually some slight adjustment because we can't statistically double count El Nino, La Ninos, but it's essentially an estimate of what the trend plus El Nino or La Nina state looks like. Okay, so the trend is the trend of the last 10 or 15 years? Yes. So regardless of El Nino, La Nina that's, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question from Andrew Brown. Yeah, this is actually Catherine Rowden. Uh, it goes to the statement about the five consecutive periods of a three-month average. To sure, the, yeah. To classify the El Nino, La Nina retrospectively. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a three a three period, three month average. Yeah, so it yeah, I sort of really kind of quickly went over this. I I <laughs> I'm actually not a huge fan of our, our five because I feel like it's a little arbitrary, but ultimately in order to kind of extract El Nino and La Nina events from the historical record, so this I underline retrospectively because it really only helps if you're looking at a complete historical record. In other words, it doesn't work very much in real time. Um, is that we extract our El Nino La Nina's using the five consecutive three month periods. So an example would be, um, you know, DJF and then JFM and then FMA and MAN and then AMJ. So that would be a consecutive five month period that we would define as El Nino or La Nina. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just thought that previously it had been three consecutive three months, but I guess that was just. Um, no, it's always, it's always been five. And, and then, and I sort of, you know, it, it, it's not, certainly when we're operationally predicting El Nino, La Nina, one of our criteria is not necessarily the expectation that it's going to last five. Five is a little arbitrary. It's sort of a subjective uh, cutoff uh, in order to classify El Nino and La Ninos. Um, and there are times where we see four, and four can have its own impacts. But in order to create composites and make comparisons, five is what uh, folks determine. This was well before my time. OK, thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, we have uh, one time for one more question yeah, from, okay, from John Eyes. Uh, he typed a question in the uh, chat box here. What would you recommend as the best web links to view the CFS model? Um, oh, sorry. What would you, uh, what would you recommend as the best web links to view the CFS model? Okay, sure. I think I can bring up the web, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe I can't find it. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Okay, this is for the CFS model, right? Okay, can I just move it here? Yep. Okay, great. All right, so if you go to the CPC webpage, um, if you go to um, uh, El Nino La Nina, you click that, and these links are all actually in the PowerPoint. Um, in fact, I didn't show this, but um, past the summary, there's additional links. Well, anyway, you can go to Outlooks here, um, and or you can just scroll down. So here's the top page, scroll down, and you'll see uh, consolidated uh, an SST index, and you'll see seasonal SST Outlook if you click that. And unfortunately, this is still kind of an old link, but if it's showing CFS version one, so you want to look at, click again to get CFS version two. And here we have a more complete diagnostics of looking at CFS models. Um, you can also look at our weekly ENSO update, um, and that's updated uh, every Monday. And if you go here to weekly, um, what's shown on the screen, and click that, you'll also get the latest CFS forecast.